Please take your Bibles and turn with me, if you will, back to that portion of Scripture that we read just a few moments ago. We're in Exodus chapter 15. We're looking, as you recall, at the ten times that the Jews rebelled against God during their wilderness wanderings. Last week we introduced rebellion test number four, which was actually a replay of test number two, which is walking by faith for water, one of the basics of life. God wants us to learn to trust him for basics. All the time we're asking for all kinds of stuff that are beyond the basics. God knows what we need. But God wants us to trust him for the basics. And here they were walking again by faith for water, except they didn't walk by faith. They griped, they moaned, they groaned, they complained, they belly ached that God wasn't doing what they thought he should do and when they thought he should do it. We pointed out the Rephidim occurred just before they reached Mount Sinai and received the law but it's still counted as one of the 10 times of rebellion based on the light that God had already given to them. Light that told them who God was and what his character was like. So their judgment was not based merely on the law of Moses because this is before the law was given. It was based on light that had been given to them concerning the nature of God in three ways. Number one, the light of nature. And Paul explains that in Romans chapter one. Number two, the light of conscience. Every man has a conscience. He knows the difference between right and wrong, and Romans 2 deals with that, and concludes on the basis both of the light of creation, what we can see about God, the invisible things of him, from the creation of the world, are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power in Godhead, so that, Paul says, they are without excuse. Likewise, their conscience bearing witness, the meanwhile accusing or else excusing one another, in the day when God shall judge the secrets of every man's heart according to my gospel. That's what Paul writes in Romans 2. So creation, you're guilty. Conscience, you're guilty. And then Romans chapter 3, of course, is an in-depth exposition of God's special revelation to people, and people have rejected that as well. So the conclusion is all are guilty. Later points of rebellion that we look at in the uh, wilderness wanderings will highlight their rebellion against specifics in the law. But these different occurrences occurred before the law and are therefore responsible, the Jews are therefore responsible for violating the light that God had already given to them. There are no no man that is uh, guilty that has an excuse and can say, I didn't know. We learned a second lesson of application from Exodus, the tests and the failures, Uh, not just here at Rephidim, but all the way through, we found many things that show something about the important character qualities of Christ because the Apostle Paul says the rock that followed them, that led them through the wilderness, the one who lived in the pillar of fire and the pillar of smoke was the pre-incarnate Christ. The Lord Jesus Christ is called the judge of Israel. And so we find him explained in 1 Corinthians chapter 10. Paul makes a point about Christ the Savior and the judge with the events of Rephidim and also the other events that took place in the wilderness wanderings. This is 1 Corinthians chapter 10, beginning in verse 1. Moreover, brethren, I could not, I would not, that she should be ignorant, how that all our fathers were under the cloud, that's the Shekinah glory that led them out of Egypt, and all passed through the sea, there's the crossing of the Red Sea, and were all baptized into Moses in the cloud and in the sea, and did all eat the same spiritual meat, remember they got manna, All drank the same spiritual drink, for they drank of that spiritual rock that followed them, and that rock was Christ. And that brings us to Rephidim, where Moses smote the rock, and water came out of the rock uh, to satisfy their thirst. But with many of them, God was not well pleased, for they were overthrown in the wilderness. (laughs) Yeah, a minimum of two million died and only two lived that were adults at the time of the Exodus. With many of them, God was not well pleased, for they were overthrown in the wilderness. Now, these things, ha- these things were our examples. In other words, pay attention, we're supposed to learn something from this, to the intent that we should not lust after evil things as they also lusted. Neither be ye idolaters, as were some of them. As it is written, the people sat down to eat and drink and rose up to play. Neither let us commit fornication, as some of them committed and fell in one day, three and twenty thousand. Remember, we saw the uh, Balaam incident. Neither let us tempt Christ, as some of them also tempted, and were destroyed of serpents. I haven't gotten to that one yet, but (laughs) there are going to be snakes that come out and bite them. Not a very pleasant way to die. 
Neither murmur ye as some of them murmured and were destroyed or destroyed. Just for complaining. God killed people just for complaining. Then he says it again in verse 11. Now all these things happened unto them for examples, and they are written for our admonition upon whom the ends of the world are come. In other words, these things tell us something about the character of God. These things tell us something about the nature of sin. These things tell us about all the different types of sin that God judges. Remember we talked about before how all of the seven so-called deadly sins show up in the times that Israel tempted God in the wilderness. We should learn something from that. Why do you think they're called deadly? God killed people for them. Wherefore, now you say, but it eh, doesn't apply to me. Okay, Paul says, maybe it does. Wherefore, let him that thinketh he standeth take heed lest he fall. You're always on your way to the edge of the cliff. Remember that. But then he gives the great promise of verse 13, a promise I love. I memorized this when I was a kid and I lived by it many, many years now. There hath no temptation taken you, but such as is common to man. But God is faithful, who will not suffer you to be tempted above that you are able, but will, with the temptation, also make a way to escape that ye may be able to bear it. Now, last week, I made some practical applications from Rephidim on the issue of being frustrated. We've all been frustrated, yes? Anybody in here who has never been frustrated, please raise your hand. <laughs> We've all been frustrated, haven't we? Okay, we made some application from what happened at Rephidim because some of y'all are perpetually frustrated. It happens to you not just once a day, but probably two or three times a day, every day of the week. But you've got to remember that it's on that personal test. It's a personal test. You're personally being frustrated. It's on the very personal test of frustration that Moses lost his privilege of entering the promised land. He lost his principal rewards. He lost his major rewards, even though he would have to lead rebellious Israel for 40 years while he personally obeyed every other point. But he lost the big one. He lost the right to cross the Jordan River and go into the land. He got to see it, but then God said, now I'm going to take you home. The critical lesson that we learned from that is that being frustrated is not an excuse for failure to obey precisely. God had told him, Moses, speak to the rock. And Moses said, what ye rebels? Must we bring ye forth water out of the rock? And he took his rod and he smacked it. Now God was gracious. God brought water. The people didn't die of thirst. But that's the point at which God said, you did not sanctify me in the eyes of the people. Why was that important? Because Paul tells us in that passage we just read in 1 Corinthians 10 that the rock that followed them was Christ. How many times did Christ have to be smitten? That is, how many times did he have to be killed? Once. Once. See, before God had said, strike the rock, and the rock brought water. The second time, Moses is under, under a test at this point. God said to Moses, Let's see if you really trust me, if you really believe. Now, you already know that when you hit the rock, last time water came out. Now, what I want you to do is speak to the rock. Because you see, the rock was a picture and a type of Christ who only had to die for sins once. Not perpetually. He only had to die for sins once. Book of Hebrews makes a big point of that. Three times it tells us. He suffered once for sins in the end of the world. So when Moses disobeyed, and you think it's a little disobedience, God said, you broke a serious type, a serious picture, there are consequences. You disobeyed me in front of all the people. You personally disobeyed me, and you didn't do what I told you to do. You're not going to get to see the land, but you're not going to get to go in. What have we lost when we have disobeyed God? Someday I think we'll find out when we get to heaven. 
But if you've ever vented angry frustration, well, I shouldn't say if, I said when was the last time? Yeah, we've, we've vented angry frustration, haven't we? That's a warning. Danger, danger, danger. Never forget what Moses lost in a moment of angry frustration. Don't lose the same thing. God said, I want you to speak to the rock before their eyes. Numbers 20, verse 8. Moses and Aaron gathered the congregation, so Aaron was in on this too. Aaron didn't get to go into the land either. Moses, with his rod, smoked the rod twice. Verse 12, the Lord spake unto Moses and Aaron, because ye believed me not. In other words, God counted it an act of unbelief when Moses hit the rock. You believe me not to sanctify me in the eyes of the people, of the children of Israel. Therefore ye shall not bring this congregation into the land which I have given you. After all those years, 40 years in Pharaoh's palace, 40 years a wandering shepherd in the wilderness, 40 years leading the children of Israel through the wilderness, and at age 120, he's still strong. It says his eye was not dim nor his step abated. He was as strong at 120 as he was at 40. But God said, here's what it looks like to Moses. See it over there? Now time to come home. Wasn't Moses died of old age? Wasn't Moses died of some horrible disease? Wasn't Moses couldn't ha handle it any longer? God said, because you disobeyed me. When have we disobeyed? Now, let's talk about the water at Rephidim for just a minute. <coughs> Israel had forgotten once again that God could do a lot of things with water. Now, why did God, try to answer this question in your mind, why did God draw Israel's attention to water on more than one occasion here as we're going through the wilderness? Well, let me ask you the question because this is for us today. They're all dead. So why does God draw our attention to the water? I'd like to point out eight what I think are striking reasons. You know, God has written a lot of things about water in the Bible. Number one, Israel obviously missed God's point about water at the Red Sea, where God shoved these huge amount of water out of the way so that they could go across. God's dealing with water there. They're worried about water. What's the principle? Principle number one is God can move huge amount of water if it needs to be moved for his people. In other words, there is no obstacle that is too big for God to move out of the way for your benefit. The water there was 600 feet deep and 118 miles wide at the point where God shoved it out of the way and held it in walls on both sides, dried the land. It says they walked through on dry ground. He had a Shekinah glory between them and the Egyptians who were clamoring behind with chariots and warriors. Can God move humongous obstacles out of your way? Yes, he certainly can. God used water to teach them that principle. Number two, God used the water to kill the Egyptians. In other words, God can also use water to kill people if he wants to. Water is not like a pointed spear. It's not hard like a sledgehammer. It's soft. It's comfortable. It can be cooled or heated for our pleasure. We drink it. So what's the principle? God can use even soft, comfortable, and pleasing things to kill his enemies, things that they would normally enjoy, like food, you think about obesity and heart attacks, and water, people drink it, but they can drown in it too. Yeah, you're right, and our sex, give them to venereal diseases if they use it the way he didn't design, or leisure, laziness and sloth, money, you know, money's good if it's used for the right purposes, but covetousness is idolatry. And God killed them for that idolatry in the wilderness. Temporal items of the world, designed for our good, and we certainly enjoy them. But God uses these things to kill people when they break his rules in any of those areas. Third, Israel also missed the point at Marah where the water was bitter. There was water involved, but it was bitter. We just read that a moment ago. What's the lesson? God can change water when he wants to do it, for any purpose that he desires. You know, that's a point that Jesus made very clear 
at his first miracle in Cana of Galilee where he changed water to wine. There was a crisis situation at Mara. They had nothing to drink. There was a crisis situation at the wedding in the, at Cana of Galilee. And Jesus' mother comes begging him to do something about it. What's the principle? God can turn a crisis situation into a time of blessing and human joy. God did so in both places. He did it at Mara. He turned it into a blessing and a joy. He did it at the wedding feast in Cana of Galilee. Number four. Rephidim was where Moses struck the rock, producing water. And we see that in two chapters, chapter 17 and chapter 19 of Exodus. In other words, here is God who can make water show up anywhere he wants it to show up. <laughs> Did you ever consider that? God can make water show up anywhere he wants it to show up. Just like he could speak in the days of creation. God said, let there be light, and there was light. God created the land animals. God created the sea animals. God created the plants. God created the stars. God created man in his own image and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. God can make it show up any place he wants it to show up. Here's the principle. Remember, when the sky is like brass and you feel like Israel did, surrounded by dirty, dry rocks in your life, Remember, there's a God who can and will provide. He always does. Fifth, I think God wants us to know that water is important. It certainly is important to him. Seventy percent of the surface of the earth is currently covered with water. And water contains more visible life forms than dry land. In all the oceans of the world, there are a lot more fish than there are animals on earth. What's the principle? This should be self-evident, but when God does a lot of something, he designs it as a wake-up call to open our eyes to see what he's trying to teach us. We just read that Paul said in 1 Corinthians 10 that these things happen to them as examples for us upon whom the ends of the world are come. In other words, God says, wake up, I'm trying to teach you something through this. And I've done an awful lot of it. <laughs> and when I do an awful lot of it, it's a wake up call. I would love for you to pay attention to what I'm trying to tell you. Number six, you know, there was another time that God moved more water than he did at the Red Sea. I know you know it. God used water to kill the entire world in the days of Noah and the great flood. God used water to give us a sign, it says so in the New Testament, to give us a sign that there is a future judgment coming. A judgment this time by fire, because God promised he'd never again destroy the entire earth by water. Now, if that was a local flood, God broke his promise. There are a lot of people who say, well, it was just a local flood. Listen, if it was a local flood, and it took Noah over 100 uh, years to build the ark, he could have walked out of the danger zone. He didn't need to build a boat. It was not a local flood, folks. It says it covered the whole earth so that even the tops of the mountains were under the water. That's why you find seashells at the top of the Himalayas. Even Mount Everest. You're right. There are seashells and fossils ocean going fossils at the tops of those mountains. Peter makes it clear when he compares the flood of Noah to the coming fury of God when the heavens and earth are consumed by flaming fire. What's the principle we learn from this? God gives undeniably visible and overwhelming reminders that he will certainly judge sin and rebellion. You can't miss it folks, it's all over the earth. Billions of dead things buried in rock layers laid down by water all over the earth. The only way that could get there was not by long periods, but by a catastrophic flood over the face of the earth. Things like, for example, in the Grand Canyon where you see petrified tree trunks running up through several hundred layers of rock. How did they get there? 
not laying flat in one layer, standing upright. It's all of the layers were laid down almost instantaneously after the flood as the flood waters were receding. We see an illustration of that in the explosion of Mount St. Helens uh, where the Tuttle River carved a brand new canyon, one tenth the size of the Grand Canyon, and laid down hundreds of rock layers from the deposits that it left from the ash flow. Number seven, I think this is a beautiful one. Water particles are also what composes the rainbow. God gave that at the end of the flood to signify that he would never again destroy the earth by water. The rainbow, God's symbol of beauty and mercy and grace, given to man after the judgment by the great flood. It's a very simple principle. Even in judgment, God is still a God of beauty, a God of mercy, and a God of grace. And eighth, I really like this one because it's what ties us into the second half of Rephidim. Number eight, Jesus also made it clear that water is one of the principal symbols for the Holy Spirit. That's very clear in the New Testament. Listen to what Jesus said in John chapter 7, beginning in verse 37. In the last day, that great day of the feast, Jesus stood and cried, saying, If any man thirst, let him come to me and drink. He that believeth on me, as the scripture hath said, out of his belly shall flow rivers of living water. Now get verse 39. But this spake he of the Spirit, which they that believe on him should receive, for the Holy Ghost was not yet given, because that Jesus was not yet glorified. The pouring out of the water on the feast day. Jesus says, if you believe on me, that's what you'll get. The water speaks in scripture of the Holy Spirit. I'm sure you're well aware that the Holy Spirit is intimately connected to prayer and to spiritual warfare. We see that over in Ephesians chapter 6. I'm going to read the entire passage because we see the two things tied together. We see spiritual warfare connected to prayer. Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. Wherefore, take unto you the whole armor of God, that ye may be able to withstand in the evil day, and having done all to stand. Stand, therefore, having your loins girt about with truth. He starts with truth. The Bible says, Jesus himself said, John 17, sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. Your loins, where you reproduce, girded with truth. Having on the breastplate of righteousness, what's behind the breastplate is your heart. You're protecting your heart with righteousness. Wickedness exposes your heart to attack. Your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. How do you go? to witness to others if you cannot walk. Above all, taking the shield of faith, wherewith you shall be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked. In other words, you're in a war. You are going to come under attack. You must have a shield whereby you say, I believe God no matter what you say. I don't care what experience shows. I don't care what you think about it. I don't care what philosophers say. I don't care if the whole world votes for it. If it's not according to scripture, I don't believe it. I believe the word of God, the shield of faith. I'm going to believe what God has told me, and it doesn't matter what you say. If you don't have that, you will find yourself not only under constant attack, but constantly in defeat. And take the helmet of salvation. That protects your mind. That protects your head, that which guards and directs all the rest of your body. 
and the sword of the spirit. That's the only offensive weapon listed in all of the armor here. Doesn't talk about a bazooka, it talks about the sword. Doesn't talk about a slingshot, it talks about a sword. Doesn't talk about an airplane, it talks about a sword. That's something you hold personally in your hand, not something you're directing from the ground like a drone. The sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. Now, there it is, all the armor. But now, how do you keep in communication with headquarters? How do the soldiers know what the general wants them to do? Here you have it, verse 18. Praying always with all prayer and supplication. Now get the next three words. In the Spirit. The Holy Spirit is connected to both warfare and prayer rather interesting. The water that God used in judgment, a symbol of the Holy Spirit. The water that God uses for refreshment, a symbol of the Holy Spirit. Spiritual warfare and prayer connected in the Spirit. You know, there are no mistakes in the Word of God. God puts things together because he wants us to learn them. He wants us to see how they work. He's giving us a detailed analysis of the mechanics, if you will, so that we will have confidence that this, when we apply the Word of God, is going to produce tremendous effects in our lives. Supplication in the Spirit and watching thereunto with all perseverance. In other words, you stick to it. You don't give up. You say, well, I prayed once for a gold Cadillac, and it wasn't out in the parking lot, so I guess I'm getting involved in prayer in general. No, no, no. There are certain things you pray for that you shouldn't. You have not because you ask not. You ask and receive not because you ask amiss that you may consume it upon your own lusts. You adulterers and adulteresses, know ye not that friendship with the world is enmity with Christ, with God? You see, if you're asking for stuff so that you can have it for your own benefit, you're going to get a no answer from God. Devil might give you a yes answer, but God's going to give you a no answer. Because that's not the purpose of prayer. It's part of spiritual warfare, not part of spiritual indulgence. And here's something Paul said to pray for me. You ought to pray this for your pastor. You ought to pray this for all the missionaries. And for me, that utterance may be given to me, that I may open my mouth boldly to make known the mystery of the gospel for which I am an ambassador in bonds, that therein I may speak boldly as I ought to speak. Pray for me that I will open my mouth boldly and not be a coward and not pull back because I'm afraid what somebody's going to think about it. Frankly, folks, I don't want to care what people think. I only care what Jesus thinks. That's why sometimes my messages may seem abrasive. Because God called me to preach the truth. Some people don't like it. They turn off their ears. They say, you know, Talk to my hand, because my face isn't listening. Praying always with all prayer and supplication. And it says for all saints, that means for all one another. You should be praying for each other. You see, spiritual warfare is a combined effort. You should be praying for whoever is the leader. For Paul, here in this case, that utterance may be given to me. That I'll be bold in my preaching. Now, Let's stop for a minute. That's shockingly significant. Because Rephidim, the test that we're looking at, is about two things. It's about warfare, and it's about prayer. You see, it was at Rephidim that Israel fought the Amalekites, while Aaron and Hur supported Moses' hands in prayer, as Joshua won a great military victory over Amalek. That's Exodus chapter 17, verses 8 and following. So we're going to learn a bunch of prayer principles from Rephidim as well as what we've just seen in relation to the water. The event at Rephidim gives an illustration, a physical illustration, of the exhortation by the Apostle Paul regarding the spiritual warfare that we just read in Ephesians 6. So let me look over here now to Exodus 17 where Rephidim occurred and then we'll compare it with Ephesians 6. Exodus chapter 17 verse 8. Then came Amalek and fought with Israel in Rephidim. Now, Israel wasn't looking for a fight. They weren't wandering out in the wilderness saying, who can we beat up next? Let's go find somebody to kill. You know, like the old 
a Gary Larson cartoon shows a Tyrannosaurus Rex and he's got a calendar on the wall and he's making X's on the calendar and uh, it says um, Jurassic Calendars is the title of this cartoon and on every calendar as uh, he's marking it off day one day two day three it says kill something and eat it <laughs> kill something and eat it kill something and eat it every day that's Jurassic Calendars that wasn't what Israel was doing they weren't wandering around looking for people to kill they weren't in the wilderness so that they could find enemies. The enemies found them. Then came Amalek and fought with Israel in Rephidim. In spiritual warfare, Satan, the enemy, will attack you no matter what you're doing. It doesn't matter what you're doing. But always he will attack you when you are walking by faith in the center of doing God's will. Israel was on the way to the promised land. The devil didn't want them to get there. The devil always has his minions out there who are going to try to stop you from growing in Christ, from growing in your Christian faith. He's going to send enemy to attack you. Just count on it. It'll be there. Verse 9, And Moses said unto Joshua, Choose us out men and go, fight with Amalek. Tomorrow I will stand on the top of the hill with the rod of God in mine hand. Now that's the rod that he had held when God said, hold it over the Red Sea and part the Red Sea. That's the rock where the first time God had said, I want you to smite the rock and water will come out. That's the rod that Moses used during the plagues in Egypt where God said, stretch out your hand with the rod over the land of Egypt and this plague or this plague or this plague with the land of Egypt. So Moses is going to go to the top of the hill. Joshua is supposed to choose some specific men. As in most warfare, and some of you have been in the military, as in most warfare, there is a division of assignments. There's selection of troops. Some guys got sent to Afghanistan and some guys did not. There are those who are sent as frontline warriors. You've got your Green Berets, you've got your Navy SEALs, like those who took out Osama bin Laden. There's always a chain of command. There's always logistical support they got to be cooks in the army, too. they got to be transport guys. they got to be all kinds of people who are doing all kinds of stuff. they got to be medics. You know, they got to be people who are willing to risk their lives even though they can't carry a gun, like chaplains. There's always the logistic support. It's a division of assignment, and God has done that in the church as well. Verse 10, So Joshua did as Moses had said to him, and fought with Amalek, and Moses, Aaron, and Hur went up to the top of the hill. Now, those of you who know anything about the military know that every subordinate officer must fulfill his role if there is to be a victory. It's not just the little munchkins on the front line. It's not just the big generals at headquarters. All the in-between officers have to fulfill their roles if there's going to be a victory. Headquarters always has to be kept appraised of what's going on out on the battlefield. There have to be people who move troops when the headquarters says, you know, move this platoon there, you know, move this division there. There is not only division of responsibility, but subordinate offers, officers are responsible for fulfilling their roles. When one doesn't, battles are lost. We're all in some subordinate role. The question is, are we fulfilling our role, or are we losing the battle here at this church? Look around you. Verse 11, And it came to pass when Moses held up his hand that Israel prevailed. And when he let down his hand, Amalek prevailed. So Moses got his rod, and he's holding his rod up. And when he's holding the rod of God up, and they're on the mountain, they're looking down, they see the battle going on. Moses got the rod up, Israel's winning. They're beating the Amal Amalekites up really bad. Moses says, man, I guess we can take a break. He drops the rod for a minute. And suddenly the battle turns. And the Israelites are running away from the Amalekites. What happened? Oh, Moses gets his hands back up again. Can't let down on his job. He's got a job to do. Now, look at some of the lessons that we learn out of this. There are always definite and doable steps in securing a victory. God never asks you to win a victory that he doesn't give you doable steps to win the victory. But if you leave anything out you are guaranteed defeat. I mean, like, what's the difference from the rod up here to two and a half feet lower where the rod is down here? 
That was the difference between victory and defeat. Little teeny thing, just like when Moses smote the rock the second time instead of speaking to the rock. Little tiny thing. It cost something big. When he let the rod down, there were people getting killed. Did you get that? When he let the rod down, people were getting killed. And his troops were running. You can't make up your own rules for spiritual warfare. I hope you know that. Lifting up of the hands is a symbol in Scripture of intercessory prayer before God. It's all over the Old Testament. With prayer, there is victory. Without prayer, there is defeat. Let me make an application. You need to be here for prayer meeting. You may personally be the key to the failure or the success of this church in the spiritual warfare. You may be the one step or key missing in order for this church to move forward. You may be old or middle-aged or young or a teen or a child but you are personally critically important for the spiritual warfare of this church verse 12 but Moses hands were heavy I mean just think about this that was no twig he was holding up they took a stone and put it under him and he sat thereon, and Aaron and her stayed up his hands, the one on the one side and the other on the other side, and his hands were steady until the going down of the sun. Never forget it. Did it ever occur to you that leaders get tired too? Try holding up your own hands in the air with a heavy stick for even one hour. See if you can even do it for one hour. Moses had to do it all day long until the sun set. Sometimes a leader needs to sit and rest while still being involved in prayer, but others need to be there to hold up his hands as well. Aaron and Hur needed to hold Moses' hands steady. Note something else about this passage. It was not an instantaneous victory. It lasted from early morning until sunset. Aaron and her had an all-day job. It wasn't a part-time job. It was an all-day job. Just like Moses and Joshua had all-day jobs. Joshua's role was to lead the army down on the field. Moses' job was to hold up the rod. But there were two other guys that were necessary with all-day jobs to make sure that both Moses and Joshua succeeded in what God had called them to do. Stop about and think about this. It might have been a boring job. <laughs> I think it was a boring job. Oh, man, we're holding the... You know, how long till, uh, till 6.30? You know, got your watch out. I can't see. I'm holding up a hand. <laughs> it was a boring job. Let me ask you a question. What boring job has God given to you to do to support the pastor of this church? Are you doing it? Nobody is exempt from spiritual warfare faced by this church. And because this church has had such an impact for Christ in the past, you can expect a lot more spiritual warfare going on here. A lot more attacks here. Verse 13. And Joshua discomfited Amalek and his people with the edge of the sword. Now, read that verse again. How many people are mentioned there? 
Joshua discomfited Amalek and his people with the edge of the sword. The only one is Joshua. You know, Joshua got credit for the victory, but it was actually a team effort. That was the whole point of that chapter. God was not forgetful to record the parts that Aaron and Hur played in the victory. Moses was the commander-in-chief, and Aaron was the high priest, so we would expect them to get at least a little bit of the credit. But who was Hur? H-U-R, not H-E-R. Because of his faithfulness, he was left with Aaron and Aaron when Aaron was put in charge of the people when Moses ascended to Mount Sinai. Did you know that? When Moses went up to get the law, Hur was left in charge with Aaron, Exodus chapter 24, verse 14. But he was subordinate and was not able to keep Aaron from the sin of making the golden calf. Now, we're going to talk about that later on. That's the one that everybody's interested in, in terms of the tests, the ten different times that God said, you sinned against me, and so I'm going to kill you. Josephus claims, we don't know this for sure, but Jewish history claims that he was the husband of Miriam, the sister of Moses and Aaron. But it doesn't matter, really, because God is going to give you credit if you are a faithful subordinate, not merely if you're just a leader. Verse 14. And the Lord said unto Moses, Write this for a memorial in a book, and rehearse it in the ears of Joshua. For I will utterly put out the remembrance of Amalek from under heaven. God said, I'm going to make this permanent. I'm going to put it in a book. And then you're going to read the book to Joshua so that you both know what's in the book. And the promise is, because Amalek did this, I'm going to wipe Amalek from the face of the earth. Now, we're not going to have time for that today, but, I mean, that's really incredible. Did you know that there are still descendants of Amalek today that God says he's going to wipe out, and they are some of the principal, yes, some of the principal opponents of Israel? Did you know it can be demonstrated that Yasser Arafat was a descendant of Amalek? Oh, you say, man, you're going to have a hard time proving that. No, we'll, we'll get there. We'll get there. <laughs> because there are a bunch of Amalekites that were left when they shouldn't have been left, as in the days of Saul. <laughs> oh, you you, you got to wait. Till, there's some really cool passages in the Bible. Where, I'm not going to give them all away yet uh, that talk about Amalek and that we can trace today as to who their descendants were, where they show up, and where they are today in terms of national entities. God said, though, I'm going to utterly put out the remembrance of Amalek from under heaven. And is also a demonstration that they had the writing abilities back then to write what we would call a book. It's a scroll. And Moses built an altar and called the name of it Yahweh Nisi, or Jehovah Nisi. Jehovah is my banner. For he said, because the Lord has sworn that the Lord will have war with Amalek from generation to generation. Now, who are the Amalekites? They were descended from Amalek, the son of Esau. We'll have to talk more about that next week. I'd wanted to get all the way down into Ephesians chapter 6 and see those parallels with what went on here. But I think rather than starting the next section, I think we'll go ahead and close with that. Our gracious Heavenly Father, how we thank you once again for the power of your word, for the power of prayer, for the answers to prayer that you give to the fact that you've called us together to be in prayer, not merely on our own, although we have individual prayer, but you've called us to corporate prayer because we're an army, we're a unit, we're a church. Ephesians 6 was written to the church at Ephesus. Paul wasn't just telling them, go have your own private quiet time every day. Paul was talking to them in Ephesians chapter 6 about corporate prayer for specific things and in the context of spiritual warfare, which was coming against their church as well as against them individually. Father, we pray for your blessings on your word as it's gone forth this day, that it will not return to you void, but that it will accomplish the thing that you please and that it will prosper in the thing whereto you have sent it. For we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.